to the Wayne Public Library's virtual author chat. My guest today is Anna Taylor Swearingen. Mikhail Scott is the erotic romance pen name of Anna Taylor Swearingen, a retired United Church of Christ and Presbyterian Church USA minister. Inspired by the writings of the love mystics of Beijing, Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks, Anna writes romance that is always steamy, sometimes spiritual, and sometimes both. Besides erotic romance, she writes inspirational and sweet romance as Anna Taylor and gothic romance and mainstream novels with a romantic element as Anna M. Taylor. Welcome, Anna. Please tell us a little more about yourself and your latest romance. Okay. Thanks for this opportunity to talk about myself. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I guess I started um, writing... <clears throat> Seriously, back in 2003, when I joined Romance Writers of America, I had been listening to um, a podcast from This American Life, and it was called What's Love Got to Do With It? And the first segment was about Romance Writers of America. And it reminded me how I always wanted to write. I mean, from a kid, you know, I wanted to be the Black female F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, but then life happened and I put it to the side. And then what revived my writing was X-Files fan fiction. And my mother-in-law challenged me. She said, why are you writing about other people's characters? Why aren't you writing your own? So that challenge in conjunction with that segment led me to Romance Writers of America. And that's how I got started writing. Um, right now, the latest thing I'm working on, I mean, because I work on so many things at the same time, but the latest is a short story that I hope to submit to um, the Lila Devlin's uh, latest um, Boys Behaving Badly uh, erotic romance anthology. It's called Silver Soldiers. And mine is a historical, because I write steamy historical. And it's about a Buffalo soldier returning home, unable to deal with how he has killed Native Americans, where he never felt any guilt when he was fighting in the civil war, killing su white Southerners. <laughs> but it's like now in his mind, he can't grapple with it and how the love of his wife brings him back to himself. So that's what I'm working on right now. Okay. And what about um, the book that, um, your last book, the one that was a charity in, um, anthology um, where you wrote, oh, it's falling, yeah, falling hard. <laughs> falling hard, yes. Sorry. Yeah, well, again, that was uh, the no the novella, um, Who Can Find a Virtuous Woman? Again, was about, uh, you know, set in like the 1890s. And it it's about a young woman who she's, um, her family has never been slaves and are very society focus, I guess is the best word to say. And so they want her to have a safe life and marry this very stodgy minister. And she's trying to think, oh my God, how am I gonna get out of this without hurting my parents? Cause I understand they feel this is the way to safety but it's not my way to safety. And she thinks of this young man whose family who is the first person out of his family, out of slavery and how, you know, he looks at me a certain way. I bet if I can get him to make love to me, that would solve my problem. <laughs> and so the story is about how she tries to, to get him to do this and what happens. <laughs> okay. Sounds like, you know, sounds like an interesting way of uh, encouraging uh, not having to marry the person your family wants you to. Um, do you... Um, as I um, mentioned in the bio, you write under um, a few different pseudonyms. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you write under each name? Sure. The inspirationals I write, um, I like to deal with um, life issues, but not that in a way that, that uh, prevents another model to the kind of very conservative evangelical model that's being pushed out there as true Christianity. So I, I'm, I'm part of maybe two of the most liberal Protestant denominations. And so my inspirational um, stories have gay characters who are Christian, 
uh, deal with people, you know, living together, trying to find their way using Christian moral values, but from a liberal perspective. My Gothic romances under Anna M. Taylor, I love to deal with the issues of not good and bad, but good and evil. That that there is evil in the world, but how do you how do you fight it without becoming evil yourself? And so those stories are really like second chance romances where people are trying to find their way back to one another. Then my erotic historicals, I love history. I mean, just tell me something's a historical and I said, let me read it, you know? But I, I also, in my erotic historicals, are trying to create uh, work with Christian erotic romance and Christian erotica which to many people, because of what's put out there as, you know, Christianity being conservative and evangelical, um, forces people to say, Christians like erotic romance? There's such a thing? And I say, yes, read my stories. We like sex, you know? I mean, our whole religion got started because God impregnated a virgin. So how could we not like sex? So, um, in my historicals, you get historical context of African-Americans, but there's always that kind of undergirding, wow, there's Christian tenants in this story. Hmm, what an interesting juxtaposition. So <laughs> those are my stories that way. I have to ask, have you ever gotten anyone who's like, I don't understand, like, how could you write these really explicit, explicit scenes, but also have that uh, religious aspect to it, the Christian aspect to it. Yeah, you know, but I mean, people who, most of the people who who come at me from that are coming out of that evangelical box where, um, you know, whether they realize it or not, they're perpetuating a stereotype of how early Christianity felt the body was bad and only things that were spirit were good and you know my end of the of the of the theological spectrum um, has rejected that for over a hundred years, more than a hundred years. So, someone who's genuinely curious, though, asked me to tell them more. And so that's why on my website, my Mikhail website, I talk about the the legacy of the Christian mystics and the way they talk about God in language that is very sexual. Um, so, you know, it depends on who's coming at me, but yeah, <laughs> I've, I've had a few, not many. <laughs> oh, that's good to know that there aren't that many asking. Um, is there one genre that you prefer writing to another or do you just like bounce around because of, you know, different ideas come to you um, for stories? Yep, follow the bouncing ball. <laughs> I, 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 I like, I, I like not being in a box, even though I like the boxes I step into. I mean, I, I've even written a, a, a comedic mystery that involves a ghost. <laughs> so, you know, I thought, well, this is interesting. Let me try this. And the latest story that I'm shopping around now is my first try at women's fiction. That also brings in, you know, my spiritual elements, but not in an inspirational way. You know, it's just woven into the story. So. Okay. And are you, do you work on more than one book at a time or do you like focus exclusively on one of the one of your pseudonyms? Like if you have a, a book that's due or um, do you bounce around from one to the other? I always work on multiple projects. I mean, and I, I'm wondering if <clears throat> maybe that's because in my ministry life, there were many tasks that needed to be done simultaneously. So this is just me replicating how I've always worked. <laughs> okay. um, well, you did mention um, what you're working on next for the erotic, erotica. Are you working on anything else for any of um, the other two? <laughs> um, yep. Um, uh, I've, I've got an interest in one of, in a, in an inspirational historical, uh, called a Pearl of Great Price. Uh, I had, I had pitched it to a, a secular, um, publisher 
just to get feedback. And what happened was the, the person said, this is a great story, but not for our line. So I'm recommending it to our inspirational line. <laughs> and then that editor said, wow, can I see the full? I said, it's not in any shape yet. She said, well, send it to me when it is. So I'm working on that. But then I'm also working on a uh, Christian erotica called, or what's a heaven for that um, an editor uh, from St. Martin said she would like to see. So, yep, see, a <laughs> lot of irons in the fire. <laughs> see, I see. Um, and of what you've written or what you're currently writing, do you have a favorite character? Well, you know, um, a secondary character in my Haunted Harlem Anna M. Taylor series is becoming a favorite of mine. His name is John Mortimer. He's, he's a professor at City College with an evangelical background, but he investigates the paranormal because he believes that's what's normal, that that's the proof. The paranormal is the proof of the supernatural that he believes in. He doesn't see it as a contradiction between what he's taught. So John, John is becoming uh, a very favorite character of mine. I've decided I'm gonna reintroduce him into one of my other stories that he wasn't in, but could be in. And we're gonna make sure that he's in every other Haunted Harlem story from now on. <laughs> Wonderful. He sounds like um, uh, Mulder. <laughs> you said he turned him back. So like, what if Mulder? <laughs> Mulder with Scully's Catholic background. <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that's right. Um, well, you did, well, the X-Files, you did mention that that's what kind of inspired you, the, the podcast and, and the X-Files um, fan fiction. Um, start to write, start writing. I mean, you probably have been writing longer than that if you had to write your sermons. Um, but <laughs> um, how many books have you written in total? And is there any one like thing that... Be Besides those two things, anything else you remember maybe from years ago from like college or anything that you were inspired to write or to even the concept of writing? Well, I think once I, 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 I listed all the stories I've written as opposed to the stories that I've gotten published. So I've gotten nine stories, you know, novellas, short stories published, but God only knows how many <laughs> other stories are started, outlined, you know, good God. <laughs> I don't even want to think what that number might be. Um, and, and, you know, as I think back, because my, my undergraduate training was in journalism. And I've, I, you know, so would go on stories for newspapers and things like that. And, and I think, you know, somehow wanting to my faith, because I was very active as a, I've always been active as a lay person, my faith to impact my writing, you know, you know, I, I would, I, I noticed how, like I would go on a story um, where someone's life was being affected in a court. And then the next day I had to go to another story. So it was like old news next. And something about that just didn't set right with me. And so the thing that has now stayed with me is that I want to have some kind of lasting impact with people and writing, um, and writing, you know, that, 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 that's where it happens. You know, it, it happens in sermons, but I'm retired now. So not as much, but in my writing, it's almost like my writing are my, are my new sermons <laughs> where I can Absolutely. be more edgy. <laughs> I was I, I was wondering when you said you you did journalism. It sounds like maybe um, did you ever like get caught up as you said in the story and wonder like it's so kind of like creating the rest of that person's story or you know wonder what what happened to them. Because I mean a lot of people I remember early on like reading that people sometimes read newspaper articles and then kind of as a way to develop stories. Uh huh. So no, no no I I I never did. Um because I found that outlet in the work I was doing with the church. So, you know, I accepted that this person and I have only connected momentarily and maybe never again, but here I'm in community with people and affecting their lives and how they're trying to affect the lives. And, 
you know, maybe they'll have passing moments with people and I affect people that way. So, you know, um, so yeah, I mean, I had a, uh, a colleague ask me, um, did my, kind of, does, what was the connection between romance and ministry for me? Did I ever, ever, you know, bring maybe something from my ministry life into my romance? And I said, no, never. <laughs> But what I realize is, as I look at the stories I write, the majority of them, if not all of them, are second chance romances. And I see that that's how my ministry has affected the kind of romances I write. Because, you know, the bottom line is, we, we as ministers are supposed to be telling the world, God loved you so much, you know, that God did this. And God keeps trying to love you. And God you know, wants to, wants another chance with you. So I see how, you know, my romance hasn't affected my sermons, but my sermons and my ministry life has affected my romance. <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> no, absolutely. That makes sense. And that's good. Um, I, I, I can see the parallel. Um, definitely. The whole, con the whole concept of love, which is the basis of religion, you know, <laughs> that God loves us. Um, it's just a different, an extension, the romance. Um, when it comes to writing, um, is there a, a difficult, like part of writing for you, like editing or is any part? Well, no, I mean, I love revision. Yeah. You know, one of the ways I supported myself was as a seamstress and, uh, alterations were my specialty. So I love <laughs> doing revision. Um, and I think because I work on more than one project at a time, I can't get jaded or bored with one project because it's like, well, if the juices aren't flowing there, I just move to this one. So, you know, um, also knowing the type of writer I am, I, I, when people ask, are you a plotter or a pantser? I say, I'm a plotter on steroids. <laughs> you know, oh. I'm a plotter on steroids. <laughs> and, and I don't write chronologically. So again, I'm this bouncing ball through the stories. I, 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 I hit where I hit with, with the muse, you know? And so that's why being a plotter, I have this outline. It's like, okay, here's the everyday world. Here's the inciting incident. Here's the pros and cons. Here's the first twist point. Here's the midpoint. Here's the stakes. You know, I mean, like, I know these are the things that have to be in the story. And so they keep me on track and focused. And, and I always start with the end in mind. It's like, here's where I want to end up. How do I get there? That's how I write my stories. Now, that doesn't mean that in the meanwhile, the destination doesn't change. But it's like, I'm like a train on a track until there's like a, a, a branch that I can go off on at the appropriate moment. So yeah, I don't, I don't find it hard to do the writing, but I think that may be because let's see if I started in 20, 2003 <laughs> and now it's 2022, I've been at it long enough. You know, maybe if you'd asked me back in 2003, I'd have a better answer for you. <laughs> uh, um, we have some questions in the chat, which, um, I see um, Nancy's asking, please tell me that you don't love writing a synopsis. I'm facing that right now and I hate it. She <laughs> says, and she also says that while your plotting is awe inspiring, no wonder your books flow so well. Oh, um, thanks, Nancy. No, the synopsis is dreaded for me, even though I know what it needs. You know, like um, one of my mentors, Mary Buckham, I, I praise God that in the early part of my career, she, I took a class with her on writing synopses. And she said, look, here's what a synopsis needs to hold. The inciting, the everyday world, the inciting incident, first twist point, midpoint, climax, conclusion, and make sure you show where the hero and the heroine meet, <laughs> where they start to think they're in love, when they have that first kiss, if it's not one of your inspirationals, when they do it so that they can have their crisis moment and so, you know, even though I know those are the pieces that needed to be in a synopsis, boiling it down to the 250 words or whatever, or 500 words or 10 pages, now, still difficult. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> she's glad to hear you don't like doing it also. Um, she did uh, post a comment question. Um, I am fascinated by your successful combination of romance, tick, um, uh, erotic romance and Christian romance. I write contemporary romance with explicit love scenes, no Christian elements, and I get grief from readers about the sex. I'm impressed that your readers are more accepting and open-minded of the sexuality of your characters in a spiritual setting. That is well, true. I, I, I remember when uh, a few years ago, uh, erotica and, and uh, inspirational were the two most um, successful, like the, the, the highest circulation here at the library. And I wondered to myself, I wonder if you could merge the two. And obviously you can. <laughs> You've just proven that. Um, how much for your historical romance? How much do how much research do you do for them? I can't really quantify it. I can only say that I'm in between not enough and too much. So it's like I just know when I I have enough to to set give the readers a a, a sense of the setting and what's going on for the time, but but not let it overwhelm the romance in the story, but to undergird. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, like, because I start with an idea, like <clears throat> this story, um, who can find a virtuous woman and falling hard. I, I picked the 1890s because that was, that decade was such uh, a decade of major accomplishment for African-Americans. And so I share that as this young woman is musing, look at all the things that are happening now. And she lists, you know, uh, the first heart uh, done by Daniel Hale. And, and she's like, how can, how can my parents want me to, to, to be in this arranged marriage when all of this is happening in our in African-American society? So I, I do enough research to, to make uh, it believable what the characters are feeling and what they would say. Uh, because yeah, you could, if you don't have breadcrumbs, you could go down historical rabbit holes and never come out. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Lena asks, do you have a favorite locale for your historicals? Um, when I started, I was really fascinated by learning the histories of African-Americans in the West. But um, I'm also like, but, you know, there, there's a lot of history of African-Americans in the North that is not the Southern slavery story that people don't know. And so I, I've, been, I've been writing more now. I mean, the latest, well, the last one was set, was set in Baltimore, all right? So Northeast. But, you know, writing historicals in Brooklyn, Around, around, you know, the historic uh, uh, community called Weeksville, and then creating alternate universes, you know, but but picking up on, you know, the history of African Americans in New York, where I grew up, which I know better than the West. <laughs> so it's like old adage: How about learning more about what you know <laughs> and write about that? And and. Uh uh, you know that we're, we're going to get to the question later on, which I have a lot of questions about the Gothics and the, and and set of New York. Um, but I did want to ask um, your publishing journey. What was your first novel that was published? Um, it was my an inspirational in two thousand and eight, Gothic contemporary inspirational called "Through a Glass Darkly" with um, Wild White Rose Publishing, which was part of a larger publishing house called. Wild Rose Publishing and White Rose was their inspirational line. So, you know, I won a contest. I won second place with the story. And I said, well, let me let me send this to this publisher and, um, you know, I'll get rejected. And then I can apply for uh, I forgot what the status was, uh, you know, back then, RWA, but they didn't reject it. They accepted it. <laughs> so that was my very first published uh with a publisher book okay and do you publish um mostly independent through traditional publishing um through small press i'm i'm my 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 erotic uh historicals 
have been published by Wild Rose, but their Scarlet Rose line, because they no longer have the inspirational line. That spun off and became its own publishing house. Um, but um, my, my Haunted Harlem series, I've, I started self-publishing in 2020. So I guess that makes me hybrid, you know, self-published and small press. <laughs> and do you, do you have a preference for either? Um, I really enjoy being my own boss <laughs> with the self-publishing, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I like being able to set my own deadlines. If I have to move them, then I can move them. I mean, nobody's job is, um, at risk because I don't meet a deadline or, you know, this was needed or that was needed. And I'm, I'm making connections like with, um, uh, copy editors and proofreaders and developmental editors and my my wonderful cover designer. So I'm like, I'm building community in that self-pub world. So I guess maybe I like that. I've been liking that a lot. <laughs> and um, as a self-publisher, like as you do your self-published um, books, how much do you enjoy, obviously, the time, you know, choosing the titles, choosing the art it, compared to with um, a publisher? Did you get it? You have a lot more control over it, but um, is it easy to do? Not the title, of course, the, the finding the cover art. Um, well, you know, working with someone who that that's all they do makes it easy. And my experience with Wild Rose has been really wonderful. I mean, the very first book, uh, One Breath Away, they started with, you know, a kind of, here's a Western scene background, Here's a black woman and a black man, but they look too contemporary. And we just, you know, I don't know how many iterations we worked on, but it just wasn't right. And they weren't the kind of publisher that said, this is it, take it, take it, because you can't leave it. And, in, and instead, work with me, work with me, say, well, you know what, maybe what if we leave the historical aspect off and focus on the erotic aspect? And that designer came up with the most amazing cover. I have ever seen. I mean, like, I will never ask for my rights back because I never want to lose that cover. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> Loving a cover. I mean, covers really can make or break. So that's wonderful. You fell in love with the one that they finally got uh, for you. Um, you mentioned also that you joined um, RWA mm -hmm. um, and how was it joining a, a, a writer's group? Um, do you have critique partners? Uh, how important was it to you to be part of a, a larger group of writers? Oh, super important because that's where I learned what I didn't know, you know? I mean, I, I joined RWA thinking, and I joined their romantic suspense and mystery writers chapter because I was thinking, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get some craft and then I'll start writing the mystery stories that I've always loved, you know, because I used to belong to Mystery Guild and read all, read, I read every Ellery Queen mystery, every Agatha Christie mystery. I mean, I, you know, that was my thing. And I fell in love with romance. <laughs> I mean, the community, because the community was so welcoming. I mean, if you ever get a chance to hear that This American Life episode called What's Love Got to Do With It, you hear people saying the same exact things. And uh, that, look, you know, this famous writer, I felt like I was going to throw up. She held my hand before a pitch session. Honey, you're going to be fine. I mean, it's just so supportive. You, you, this is something I feel you, you really shouldn't do alone. It doesn't mean that they tell you what to do, but it's like, you know, it's like you have a community of people cheering you on, you know, mm -hmm. that, that this isn't something you, you ought to do alone. You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to worry about, you know, am I good enough? I mean, yeah, there's all of that kind of back and forth, like in any industry, but the majority of it is so welcoming and supportive, you know, um, cheering you on to be the writer you can be. Don't worry about comparison. You know, that's the world's way of thinking. So yeah, I mean, you know, finding a community of like-minded souls uh, 
and, and writing with them is so important. And, that, and, and, and like I tell people that I've met who they've self-published by themselves and I said, well, look, you know, don't keep doing this alone. Find yourself some support. But if you don't get the support you need, keep looking. The writing community is too big to let anybody crush your dreams. That's true. That's true. Um, and you're a member of the New Jersey Romance Writers. What made you choose uh, to join them? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. The reason I joined NGRW was at that time, I was uh, an interim minister in Patterson, New Jersey. Oh, right up the road. <laughs> <laughs> and our, our um, governing meetings were on the Saturdays that the New York chapter had its meetings. But New Jersey romance writers, even though their meeting was on a Saturday, it wasn't the Saturday of my session meeting. So I said, doggone it. I belong to all these online chapters. I'm gonna join New Jersey romance writers. And that's how, <laughs> that's how it happened. So I, I, I lucked into a great group of people <laughs> because of my church work. <laughs> So you were a minister here in locally in Patterson? In Patterson. In wow. Patterson. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice to know. Um, <laughs> Nancy and Deb both are very happy that you that you decided to join the, the New Jersey Romance Writers. Um, that they're lucky to have you. Yeah, it, it's wow. a great place, a great place. And um, what advice would you give to a writer that's starting out? Well, First, number one, believe in yourself, right? Develop that confidence that what you want to do is achievable. Don't let anybody else take that away from you. But then hook up with people who are going on the same journey, right? They may not be writing what you're writing, but they too are on a journey of putting out a story or a message that they believe in. And having a fellow traveler, you know, always helps. Doesn't mean it's gonna be like, you know, everything's fun and roses all the time, but, but believe in yourself and then find like-minded people. You know, not to be a tribe, but to, 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 to feed positive, creative energy. So that's what I tell people, it's like, okay, but then when you find that group, and that positive energy ain't flowing anymore, trust your gut and go. Find some other place. <laughs> that is very important, the positive energy. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to ask the participants if they would like to ask uh, Anna any questions, if they would mind typing it into the chat box. And while we wait to see if anyone asks a question, I'm going to ask you mine, which is about your gothic romance that are all set in F in New York City's African-American communities like Harlem, Bed-Stuy, St. Albans, and East New York. On your webpage, you mentioned um, New, York's, New York's Stranger Than Fiction real-life gothic stories. Can you share any of those with us? Well, the one that, when I saw that question, the one that came immediately to my mind <laughs> is this ghost story that is told about the Morris Jamel Mansion in Harlem. Um, Eliza Jamel was married to Aaron Burr and this was her house. And, and, and they say that um, a, a group of school children who were there on a trip, because that, you know, when you're in the public school system in New York, you go to like these different museums. And so the story goes that these group of kids were being rowdy and noisy and the ghost of Eliza Jamel appeared and shush them to be quiet. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> Scary, but wow. <laughs> Co-Eliza is what Nancy says. <laughs> so yeah, that, that one, that one definitely. But, you know, it's like, but then I, I, I think about, I love using ghosts to, to reveal things about history, about the past, but about what's always around us that we never think about. You know, like when I worked, I worked downtown for a law firm to uh, pay off my college debts. And I never realized until I took a, a walking tour, a self-guided walking tour from the um, African-American Burial Ground Museum, 
how much African-American history I had been walking through all those years on my way to work that that was all around me. And if I had just stopped, I could have accessed and, and, and felt it. And so since I've been writing, I've been finding those stories and coming up with my own. So, yeah, but that Eliza Jamel story, man, it was like, ho, oh, I love it. <laughs> good one. That's a good one. Um, Lena asks, which authors do you like to read and who are your automatic buys? Who? Huh. Well, automatic buys, uh, jeepers. It's so weird because I, I, you know, a story will hit me, but definitely Beverly Jenkins. I, you know, it's coming out. I don't even need to know the story. I didn't even know the title. Just pre-order it. Um, for a long while, J.D. Robb, I loved that futuristic you know, Eve Dallas story. And I love, love, love the way she developed her relationship with Rourke. I must be 20 books behind, but it doesn't matter. If the next one is out, I pre-order it. <laughs> <laughs> so one day I will just sit down and catch up. <laughs> um, and then there's so many, you know, like I, I, like when Nancy Herkness comes out with a story, it's like, give it to me. <laughs> give it to me you know you know surely i mean so many of the people in ngrw are those yeah they got no one coming out i want it you know <laughs> but yeah um that's great yeah. um <laughs> nancy says oh shucks thanks so much i'm honored um uh deb asked how has moving from the northeast to the southwest influenced your writing in a different way hmm well, it's made me more disciplined about writing because when I was in the Northeast and working, I wrote on the, I wrote on the train and I wrote on the bus. So writing was my way of, of, you know, coming, stepping away from work. So, you know, taking the Long Island Railroad from Jamaica, which was one church where I was working to my home in Brooklyn. Then when I was working in Patterson, same thing riding on the TNJ, bus or train. But in here, <laughs> they don't have real mass transit. <laughs> they have a bus system, okay? And something they call the rail runner, which, you know, runs to some couple of cities. But it's like, that ain't gonna cut it, you know? I, I, in Brooklyn, I could just leave my house, get on the subway and start writing. So <laughs> I've had to be more disciplined about making time to write. And that's where they have a marvelous, Albuquerque has a marvelous library system. So I would go to the library. That would be my travel because you can't write while you're driving the car. Well, you know, I guess you can if you have one of those electric cars that drives itself, but I don't. <laughs> so I would drive to the library and, and I would be there for a set number of time and that's where I would write. So that's how moving here has, uh, I had to recreate how to, how to write in a disciplined way. I like to say that Shirley also thinks she's honored also. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. These, these mega multi-award winners, you know, I mean, like, holy mackerel. <laughs> I love them. Uh, <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> you um, Recreating your, your commute, Nancy says, that's hilarious that you had to, like, recreate your commute. Um, that is actually interesting. Like, I would, I would wonder about the weather if the weather influenced your writing because the Northeast with all the four seasons and, and you kind of prepare yourself for, okay, you know, it's going to be cold and now it's going to be gray. And, uh, and whereas um, you're in an area that's pretty sunny <laughs> a lot of the time. A lot of the time. And, and if it snows in the morning, it's gone by noon. So, but you know, weather really, I wouldn't say that weather or setting being in the Northeast affected me but coming out here because you know the weather is nicer more often than not you know I'm I'm drawn to the patio you know I'm drawn to get outside and go right somewhere so maybe maybe it has in a way that you know I really haven't thought about you know but my husband laughs he says you know he loves seeing me go out on the patio in the morning 
when it, when the sun is coming up and I don't come back in until it's dark. So <laughs> it must the, the it, I must be affected somehow by being in Southwest. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's a good long day of writing. That's wonderful. Um, and it says also the landscape is so different there versus the Northeast. The setting stories in the Northeast make you miss it. Not miss it, but but kind of appreciate it more. Um, like I was sharing in a post how I've been creating these banners for my Haunted Harlem series, and each of them has some kind of specific uh, photograph of a particular location in Harlem. And that when I would go back for NGRW's conference, I would make sure I took pictures of everything because I took it for granted when I was in New York. But now I'm so glad that I took these pictures because I don't miss it because I have the pictures. I can I can relive the love for the area through the pictures that I've taken. So yeah, no, I don't. Well, definitely I don't miss the weather. <laughs> wow. But but being able to see those pictures and like, oh yeah, this is so great. And oh yeah, this is Schomburg. And I gotta make sure I take a picture of this when I go back. So yeah, no. They make me, they make me appreciate and feel how much I love, you know, New York more than I realized I did. Um, we're being asked, where are you originally from and what do you consider home? Well, I'm a rich, I'm a native New Yorker, born and bred in Brooklyn. Well, first two years of my life, Manhattan, then all the others, Brooklyn. So that's where I'm originally from. I mean, when I went to seminary, <laughs> one of the preaching professors, he said, ah, you're from Brooklyn. I said, how you know? I said, you got that flat A. <laughs> and, and, you know, home for me, I realize has never been a physical place, but a sense of belonging with community. Because my very first ministry job was traveling all over upstate New York, working with churches who wanted to do church growth and evangelism. And, and home was being together with people trying to do something together, trying to, to, to you know, um, do good together. Because, you know, my mom has been living out here in New Mexico for God knows how many years. And I would talk to her on the phone. And then when they would come and visit, I'd go see her. But I didn't, you know, that sense of, you know, I guess what people call family it's never been place for me or even specific relationships, um, but common cause. Somehow, I don't know when the shift happened, but somehow common cause is, is home for me, um, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes, no, it does, absolutely. Um, Nancy says, Anna, you create a sense of community wherever you go. <laughs> oh, thanks, Nancy. <laughs> So um, if there are any other questions for Anna, um, you would mind putting in the chat. I, 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 this has been a wonderful <laughs> chat. I, I've enjoyed it tremendously. Um, and so you have to tell us because we're expecting snow. Um, what's the weather like over there? <laughs> well, it's unseasonably chilly. Like in the morning, it was 22. And then by the afternoon, it got up to 55. And that to us is still cold, oh, you know, yeah. to me, that's still cold. <laughs> so, 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 uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's nothing like what you guys are experiencing back there. I'm sorry. I mean, I ain't sorry. I'm not there, but I'm sorry. You're going through it. <laughs> um, uh, Deb says Maine is getting minus two next week. <laughs> yeah. It's not the, the temperature is not as bad as, you know, uh, snow and ice. No, and nice. <laughs> not the best. Um, again, thank you so much, uh, Anna. I, again, I very much enjoyed this conversation, and um, <laughs> I look forward to seeing your next projects. I wrote down a couple of the titles. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thank you. This was a lot of fun. Um, thank you, everybody who participated. It was nice that they all joined, and for all the questions, 
see y'all soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Happy New Year.